Hello, my name is Emmy DeGrappa. Each week, we bring you stories asking our guests the question why. We learn about passion, purpose, and the human experience. Brought to you by Wyoming Humanities, with the generous support of the Wyoming Community Foundation, this is What's Your Why? So today we're talking to Matt Haynes. He is an Emmy award-winning Texas filmmaker known for his documentaries on PBS, Amazon Prime Video, Independent Lens, Apple TV, Sundance TV, Netflix, and, and many more. And so we're so excited to talk to Matt today. Thank you, Matt, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me on. I want to learn about your journey as a filmmaker, because I think it's really interesting the films that you've decided were a part of your journey. Where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in the Dallas area, Dallas, Texas, and sort of bounced around to a few different places when I was young. Um, but in the what we call the Metroplex down here in, in Dallas, Fort Worth area. And then I uh, moved to Austin in 1997. So I've been in Austin ever since then and seen tons of changes happening here in Austin. <laughs> but that's where I am now. And that's where I am. Um, I have a production company with my wife. We run it together and it's called Alpheus Media. And so that's where we operate out of. Um, I travel to Wyoming though, a lot. How long has Alpheus Media been in existence? Alpheus Media has been in existence for 20 years, give or take. We started off in about 2000. Uh, maybe I think in the last month or so of 1999, we maybe did a project, but it just sort of grew out of a need that some people had that uh, to to produce some videos for some nonprofits, and so we started to we started off Alpheus Media making videos for nonprofits uh, to kind of like document what the nonprofit was doing to tell its story, and then we we were asked by that nonprofit to create a very large archive of interviews with people that were going through cancer. And we worked with medical professionals and people that were, um, you know, in the healthcare space to sort of design a whole way of interviewing people around their cancer experience. And then we did, like I said, 200 of those uh, and uh, or a little more than 200. And they all went up on this website. And then from that, and, and it was sort of, if you've ever heard of the Shoah Foundation, the Shoah Project was this project to interview Holocaust survivors that was started by Steven Spielberg. And we were sort of modeling it on that. And the idea being that a person going through cancer could Google, or at that time it was probably Yahoo, could search out what the exact type of cancer and then find someone being interviewed and talking about it. And, and then from there, we started doing, we get, started getting asked to do larger scope projects like documentaries. And then the first doc we did was for PBS in 2005, and it was called Last Best Hope. So let me let me just jump back a little bit because why filmmaking? What what was that journey to get into filmmaking? It's a really good question. Why filmmaking? I grew up with parents that really encouraged me to do whatever made me happy in terms of extracurricular activities. And so as a kid, I did a lot of theater. I was at a, a theater school called the Creative Arts Theater School in um, Texas, that after school, you would go there and you and other kids would basically put together a play. You know, we, we did plays, we did, uh, I directed a play in high school, and we sort of did everything like the, the technical theater aspects and building and designing things, and then also acting in things. And those were the things that I really put myself into and cared about. I wasn't big into academics. And unfortunately for my parents, uh, I started to really get into to wanting to just do a great job with these productions. And I think I was like learning from the the teachers there who all had like MFAs in theater uh, or some arts background, but most of them had graduate degrees. And they treated these plays that we were doing like they were like it, we were making Citizen Kane, you know, we or we were making a Broadway show or something like that. 
So they expected a lot out of us. And I kind of had that, that internal voice that got imprinted on me, or I would say their voice was sort of imprinted in inside of me. And then I, I started to just get really invested in doing creative projects. And I wanted to eventually be in film, but at first I thought I wanted to be an actor. Uh, and then by the time I was 15, I had done some acting in some films and I had some close calls where I almost got cast in some big productions like uh, Terms of Endearment. If you remember that movie, I was almost in that. I was up for that part of that bratty kid that like makes his mom feel bad when she can't afford to buy groceries. They didn't cast me in that. And then I was in a few other things like a movie of the week and things like that. But by the time I was like 15, I didn't want to act anymore. I, I wanted to have a little more control over what I was doing um, and not be sort of just cast based on how I looked and things like that, my height and weight and age range that I could play. I, I didn't really like that. So I wanted to direct. So I directed a play at the theater. And then after high school, then I just started, I went to college for film but I didn't really have a great experience in, in the film school that I was in. So I got uh, an internship at this production company in Dallas, and then they offered me a job. And when I was done with my internship, I started working there. And then I worked my way up from an animator, motion graphics guy to an editor. And then after that, I went freelance and started to do freelance editing and graphics, uh, like animation. And then I moved to Austin. And I took some more film school when I came to Austin. I uh, took a class from a professor, a UT professor named Steve Mims, who had a big influence on me. And I continued to freelance and then eventually had enough clients that were sort of asking me to do more than animate and more than do editing. They were asking me to direct. And so then I started a, a small production company with a friend of mine who was also a freelancer, who was a, a cinematographer. And he would shoot everything and I would edit everything. And then my wife came on board. Once we had enough projects, uh, she came on board to produce. And her name is Beth. And, and she started producing everything. And uh, then we sort of went legitimate and actually incorporated our business and divided the company up between the three of us and all that kind of good stuff. So That's a big journey. But your parents must be proud of you for having a vision and knowing that Maybe you didn't follow the traditional path, but you found your way. And I think that's really cool because a lot of times I think people just get stuck on, you know, you have to do it this way and you can't do it any other way. But the the people who find their creative path, I think, is really a wonderful, beautiful thing. And it's very inspiring. Thank you. Well, I definitely owe a lot of that to my parents for not having a traditional mindset about what I was doing in my spare time after school. I did, I did play football when I was a little kid and I played soccer and I was in a form of, of a scouts. It was called Indian guides at the time, but otherwise they, they let me do what I wanted to do. And then they enrolled me in an acting class at this theater. And then it was off to the races for me. And I really didn't ever look back at any of the other traditional stuff. And and I think, you know, them letting me do my own thing was a blessing and a curse. I think the, the curse part of it was that I definitely became the type of kid that would only focus on what I was interested in. And if I was not interested in it, I would either do a horrible job or I would misbehave and I would get in trouble because it wasn't what I wanted to be doing. And I think it's because I got this this thing in my blood early on where I could actually be a part of something that was bigger than myself that would bring joy to a lot of people. And in, in plays, I would see an audience react. And one of the things the theater would do is bring in uh, like special needs kids for Saturday performances. Like in the morning, I think they would bring in busloads of special needs kids. And those moments where we would really see, I, I would really sense that I was a part of something that was really bringing joy to these kids. That was like, they were so happy to see us perform. And then after the play, like we would go out and mingle with them. And that just got in my blood, but it got in my blood to the point where I started to just not really care about academics much at all. I was a big reader. So I continued to you know read about things a lot more than probably a lot of average kids, but it was only the stuff that I cared about and was interested in. So that was the, that was the downside of it. And my parents were 
pretty understanding, I would say. I'm pretty understanding. Of course, they're, you know, they're still parents. So they definitely wanted to make sure that I was, that I had some sort of a future, <laughs> but they let me do my thing. And then I think that what, what happened there for me, like I bring that with every film I do or with every TV series that I produce, I bring that same kind of intensity that I had when I was doing these plays as a kid to each thing. I'm, I'm trying to just always bring the audience something and, and, and have this, this sort of like maybe a cathartic experience is maybe cathartic is kind of a pretentious word, but it was cathartic for me to, to do those things. And so each project that I do, I try to kind of go through that same emotional intensity and that same kind of catharsis when I um, interview people and go out and travel and film people. Is one of the reasons that you do documentaries is because it can be more of a creative process versus doing other kind of filming? I mean, why did you choose docuseries and documentaries as your path? I had wanted to make narrative films and I did make some short films. And the, the way that I got into documentaries was sort of luck and happenstance. There was a producer that I worked with and I was working with her in the capacity of, of as an editor um, and a person that did motion graphics. And she had this idea about doing a World War II documentary um, about a pilot that had an American pilot who had crashed behind enemy lines during World War II and he crashed in Belgium. And she did all this work of raising money to try to get these interviews shot and she had all this footage uh she and her partner david um were these two producers and they they brought it to us to edit they brought it to me to edit and and alpheus uh, this was pretty early on this was like 2004 maybe 2003 and i started to edit it and put it together and i was sort of wishing that i had footage that i didn't have uh, and i could picture things that, that needed to have been shot that just weren't because there wasn't, they, they had had a director, but I think he, he came and went and there wasn't like one particular, you know, hand guiding the whole creative of the, of the process. And so anyway, that was the moment when I decided that it was worth my time, even without getting compensated that I wanted to go out and try to shoot some stuff and develop additional material that I could use to tell the story that I wanted to tell as an editor. And so I went from being an editor to being a director, you know, it was gradual, but it also, for that particular project, it was kind of overnight because it was like, well, I guess I'm directing this. And I think that in terms of filmmaking and, and how you get into a, a situation where you're doing the projects that you want to be doing, I wouldn't recommend what I did to, to really everyone, but what I what I did was I decided to find windows of opportunity where there was a project that was attractive to me, where it was like, I want to be doing more projects like that. And if I could do everything I can to make this amazing, then maybe it will lead me to another thing like that. Whereas there are other projects where you're like, that isn't really where I want to be. And so I'm going to do not the bare minimum, but you're going to do what you need to do to get it done to, to the best of your ability but you don't pull, you don't pour your blood, sweat, and tears into it. And but with Last Best Hope, I really did put blood, sweat, and tears into it. I would stay at, at the office editing until four or five o'clock in the morning. I really thought it was something that was special. But I owe that to Ramona and David for kind of bringing me that project initially, and then believing in me to let me take over as a director. And then when that project was when we had that edited, we were able to do a screening in Belgium. And we were invited actually by the Belgian government to screen it for the Prince of Belgium. And this was just mind blowing that we could actually take this over there and, and do that. And it was at the Imperial War Museum. So we did this screening there with the Prince and it, it was a rough cut of the film, but it was like, it had all these dignitaries. And then eventually the American embassy came and I think someone from the Russian embassy was there. And um, out of that screening, you know, that I, I knew that that is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I wanted to be a, a filmmaker and I wanted to do documentaries because the reason for documentaries in that particular instance was we had all these interviews with people in the Belgian resistance who had been very young at the time. And I had all this archival uh, footage and photos of them when they were in their early 20s, like women 
who would be guides for airmen who would crash and they would take them from safe house to safe house. And I'd been spending, you know, I'd spent like a year or more editing to all this footage. And then suddenly I get to see these people who are now in their 90s there. One of them was this incredible woman um, named Day Day De Young, and she was brought in in a wheelchair. I got to see her and connect with her. And then after the film, one of the people in the resistance came up to me and grabbed my hand and with her tiny little hand, she squeezed my hand really hard and she just kept saying verite, verite. It means truth and you know, in French. So I got just really emotional that she said that because it was something that I had really tried hard to to do it. I had tried hard to make it true. And then her reaction to that was like more important to me than anything else. And so for better or worse, I've kind of continued making documentaries like that, where the reaction of the people that's involved is more important in some ways than the the success or the distribution or the awards or anything like that. And it's a formula that kind of we just keep that my wife and I keep trying to replicate on films. Well, I think it's interesting that you had your directorial debut with Last Best Hope. And that film was about the Belgian resistance and escape lines during World War II. And then I thought it was really beautiful, too, that you did a film called When I Rise. And how did that film come about? One of the funders of Last Best Hope was a man named Don Carlton, and he runs the Briscoe Center for American History, which is at UT Austin. And it's a repository of documents, historical documents. There's a lot of famous people that have given their papers and their their archives to the Center for American History at UT Austin. And uh, Don had put a little bit of money into Last Best Hope, and then he had the papers of this woman named Barbara Smith Conrad, an African-American opera singer, mezzo-soprano, who had sung with the Met and had gone to UT. Um, she was a UT alum. He had all of her papers and he was beginning this spirituals initiative where he was going to collect things around black spirituals and, and uh, churches in the, in the South and in Texas. And Barbara was going to sort of be the ambassador for his collection. And he had the idea to make a documentary about her life. And so invited me to, in to meet with her and we, Barbara and I hit it off. And then uh, within a few months, the Center for American History had raised just enough money for me to be able to go out and film Barbara in a, a tiny East Texas church singing uh, some opera for some of the people that she grew up with. And that was the first shoot. And then that began a three-year process of making When I Rise. Um, and When I Rise, we, we filmed in New York and we filmed in Texas and all over the place and in the U.S. because Barbara had a really big career. But the whole film kind of became about her arc of of forgiveness, of forgiving what had happened to her in Austin in the 50s. And then we finished that film up and then it premiered at South by Southwest. And Barbara got to see that and, and be with me and go up on stage during that that premiere. So that's how that film happened. So, so far, your journey has been about telling real people's stories. And that seems like that's your passion is to expose something or shine a light on something. In doing that, is it tough to make a living because you work for a lot of nonprofits, it seems like? It's a balancing act to earn a living and do projects that have integrity. And definitely the balancing act is always ongoing. <laughs> I mean, the short answer is that we, my wife and I have a production company and we take on lots of projects. I think at the moment, we're probably producing 14 projects. Two of those projects are series, like docu-series. One of them is a feature doc. The rest of them are shorter projects. They're shorter turnaround projects so that we, you know, maybe we'll be done with it in like six weeks. And we have a staff, we have a core staff of 10 people at Alpheus Media. And that's always in flux. It's, you know, as of as of the time of this recording in February 2023, we have 10 people core, and then we scale up to like 25 people, depending on the projects that come in and what if we need freelancers. But Austin has a tremendous market for freelancers and independent editors and cinematographers, um, musicians, audio mixers, graphic designers. So we draw on a lot of talent in Austin. 
And then we, like I said, we have a staff also. So how we kind of manage that is that I tend to focus on the documentaries and I tend to focus on developing new projects and, and Beth does too. And then we have a, you know, a group of people that help us to get the other stuff done. And yeah, we still do some nonprofit films. There's some nonprofits and educational institutional type of work that we do that we just are passionate about. We do occasionally do some commercials, TV commercials, things like that, that I direct. And we do projects that are, you know, sometimes, honestly, we we need a break from such heavy material. And so it's fun to do things like we collaborate uh, or have collaborated with this online company called Rooster Teeth to make documentaries about internet culture and you know memes and the history of of the internet and things like that. So that stuff is fun as a as a as a way to divert ourselves. But you know you have to make a living. So that's what we've we've tried to make a living, but also still leave room to do projects that we care about. I see how you you know it's a juggling act between spending the time doing docu series, which, like you said, they're serious and you're telling a story, and you have to be out in the field and get all the footage and the viewpoints and hear people's voices so that you can use them in the documentary and all that. You know, is probably a lot of heavy lifting. Do people come to you, or do you go to them, or do you have a big idea, or? Or do people come to you and and you like pick and choose the stories you want to tell? It has evolved over the last 20 years. There are times when we originate a project and we go out and put our own resources into starting the project. And then we try to then raise money to fund the budgets. So we did, did that with a film called um, What Was Ours? That evolved from a project that we had been doing with Wyoming PBS. And then we finished that project, but we had, we had this momentum with another story. And so we started doing that on our own and raised the money and and, raised, and actually did grant writing, worked with a grant writer to try to raise funds for that. And there are other projects that are like that, where we've kind of initiated it first, but lately in the last you know, probably five years or, or so. A lot of the projects come to us and then we choose what we want to do. So we do turn down a lot of projects, but, you know, we're, we're fortunate to be in that position at this point. But also it's like, we can't do everything. <laughs> There's lots of amazing projects that I wish we could do all of them for the most part, but we have to turn down some stuff. Well, you'd have to clone yourself for one thing, you know, to do everything you want to do. And I was thinking, you know, just the the intricacy of making documentaries and a docu series, and thinking to myself, I don't know, I was reading something the other day, and it's like everybody's a photographer. And if you have an iPhone, you're a photographer, or you can make video on your on your iPhone. And so everybody's a video a videographer, whatever. <laughs> How do you feel about? What is the difference between the professional and the amateur? And how does it get just misrepresented for people like on social media? I would say that you can be a filmmaker or a storyteller, whether or not you have an iPhone or you have a production company and expensive equipment. You can really be a filmmaker and a storyteller, and you can call yourself that, and it's valid. I think I can't speak for other people that do documentary films or or narrative films. But for me, I think what separates what I do versus someone making like TikTok videos or whatever is I tend to, you know, in a year, an average year, I'll interview between 200 and 250 people. And those people are all from different places in the world, like backgrounds and I have to do a lot of research before I go out and interview those people to sort of know what to ask them. And then once I do the interviews with those people, then I have to work with editors to weave all of those voices into something that is resembles a coherent statement or, or a coherent whole, but that still retains those points of view, but also synthesizes it in some way, or at least attempts to get at the at the truth of something because you know not everybody agrees of course but and i'm bringing my own perspective to it as well so i think you know what i do versus 
just picking up a phone. I mean, I could definitely, it would be a lot easier, I think, if I just scaled it down and went around with, you know, a small camera and, and did that. But the world moves really fast right now. And doing 200 to 250 interviews and then putting them all together into one coherent series or film is a lot of work. And that's where you need a team. You know, it's not just one person that can do all of that. You need a team. And so part of the other thing I think that I do is I put together teams of people to help me in that endeavor. But um, yeah, I mean, I think you can be a storyteller and make TikTok videos too, but that's not really what I do. What I'm trying to do is like tackle really complex subjects and talk to all of these amazing people to help an audience understand a topic that's really complicated and and weave it all together into a series of like, say, like one hour episodes, six part series. And I'm doing one on energy right now, the history of energy, everything from coal and natural gas and nuclear and entertainment and culture and, and how energy has affected our culture and our entertainment. And it's a very big undertaking and it's, but it's something that I rely on a lot of other people to, to do. So I think that you just named it. That's the difference is that, yes, everybody can tell their story and their perspective and do uh, an Instagram or a TikTok video or whatever, but it's really just one perspective. And what you're providing is the whole view the you know, the whole series of different voices and, and coming to a place where you can tell this really well-rounded story about a subject. And I wanted to ask you more about your film, What Was Ours? And what set you down that path? And what was that film about, first of all? What Was Ours was on Independent Lens, and it was at a lot of film festivals. And it, you can watch it on Prime Video now. So it's out there. It's included with Prime. But the beginning of that story was actually, it was a project that was working with Wyoming PBS. And there's a writer in Wyoming, a really a great writer named Jeff O'Gara. And he had this idea to do a virtual museum to take, essentially do three-dimensional video of artifacts that had once belonged to the Arapaho and the Shoshone people and create a digital repository of this because these artifacts were in museums far, far away from the the people that could appreciate them the best. So a lot of the, in a lot of times, a lot of cases there in museums like the Smithsonian and the Field Museum and places in Europe. And so it was a great idea. So we we worked on this project together. Or I worked on it with Wyoming PBS. And when that project was finished, there were a lot of unanswered questions about the artifacts and sort of who owned the artifacts and, and how the tribe was reconnecting with these pieces that brought up a lot of emotions with certain people. And there was an elder, Shoshone elder named Philbert McLeod, who's passed away now, but he really kind of, I mean, in, in a way he wanted to keep going. He wanted to keep talking to me about this topic. And so I started to film more interviews with Philbert after the, the project for YMPBS was done and that, that scope was finished. I started to interview Philbert and then Philbert began to tell me about his experience in Vietnam. And he had been a, a soldier in Vietnam who had been in, in uh, combat. He was a helicopter or he actually was a gunner in a helicopter and he had crashed at one point and he was in the jungle and he had this item that had been given to him by his mother that was important to him and it was sacred to him and he believes that it kept him safe and him telling me that story and then he shared with me some footage that he had filmed he he was a photographer and he'd actually had a super 8 camera and filmed some things in vietnam and i i just i couldn't basically couldn't stop <laughs> filming so at that point i sort of went and uh raised some money from itvs and a few other grant entities like Vision Maker Media and continued to film with Filbert. But then more things started happening too with uh, Jordan Dresser, who went off to work on get a master's in museum studies. And then Michaela Sun Rhodes, who was an Arapaho woman who was also working through finding her identity and working on powwows and, and things like that. She was Miss Denver March. So we had these, I had these three people that essentially were, you know, participants that I couldn't stop filming. I didn't want it ended essentially. So we, we just spun that off into a whole new film. And that took about two and a half more years, I think. 
And then um, we finished that film and then we premiered it at the Big Sky Documentary Festival. And then it went went to Independent Lens as well on PBS. It got a national broadcast and now it's on Prime. I am so jealous of you because I love hearing people's stories. And, and I do this, you know, all the time as a podcaster, but you do it in a bigger way where you're going out and being in place with someone and going deeper. And then you're like following a trail, following a story, and then it takes you someplace else. And then, you know, it's like, it's, it's unending, but it's so magical. I think I can see why you love it so much. I guess it's a little bit like what could get in your, in your blood if, as a journalist or as a detective almost it, it just i i become i've become addicted to doing research and finding out stories and then trying to understand people's lives and how they relate to the past and history is something that has always excited me but i didn't really know that what would really get me going is when i can make history particular like if i could if i can make history crystallize in a person and their individual experiences, then I feel like I can bring history to life in a way that everyone can understand it and relate to it. And that's important to me because I think history is important. I think if you don't know where you've come from, then you don't know where you're going. And I think especially with the way how fast the world is moving now and with digital tools and social media that a lot of times we're cut off from history. You know, there's like a the Super Bowl commercial about the new camera where you can take a picture and then you can easily remove people from the picture. And it's a cool technology, but it also is it's one of those things where it's like, really, you know, do we really want to just give people the tools to be able to erase history? You know, I I have pictures in my closet that maybe have people that I no longer am friends with or something, and it's uncomfortable to have that, but I still feel like that's important to have, to have a record of that. And so, sorry, I'm rambling now, but just, I think history is important is, is the bottom line, but I think it's not really, you can't really make history relatable unless you can crystallize it with a particular person. I like what you said about that. I'm going to use that quote for you because the fact that you use that word crystallize, that you really take people in a place and a time where they can relate or they can learn. And maybe that in that moment, their own experience is crystallized. And that is a really beautiful way of thinking about it. Cause you can't, I, I know what Super Bowl commercial you're talking about. I saw that one too. <laughs> I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. But I like what you said, like, you know, you can't really throw away people, which I feel like is sometimes what happens in our new technology. You can just throw away things, throw away people. I mean, we're huge consumers. We throw away everything. So it just makes you think about the whole picture of that. And I really appreciate that you, you just made that come to life for me. So Matt, yeah. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for talking to me. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us for this episode of What's Your Why? Brought to you by Wyoming Humanities with support from Wyoming Community Foundation and generous supporters like you. To learn more, go to thinkwhy.org, subscribe, and never miss a show. 